All right, well, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who have uh, been with us this morning, you'll know that our sessions have been tremendous um, and quickly has surfaced oh, yes. what is stake in creating a research agenda. Um, I am looking forward to the talks and discussion this afternoon. Um, and we will start with our second plenary uh, talk um, by Dr. John Carpton. Uh, Dr. John Carpton is an internationally recognized leader in cancer genomics and precision oncology. He is the founding chair of translational genomics at the University of Southern California. His current work focuses on DNA and RNA sequences of tumors to identify biochemical vulnerabilities that can be targeted with new and existing therapies. He was a lead author on the first study to probe the entire genome for inherited prostate cancer genes, and on that study identified a novel mutation in a gene that plays a role in the development of breast, colorectal, and ovarian cancers. Dr. Carpton will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then again, we'll open it up to questions uh, from the workshop participants. So thank you very much for being here, Dr. Carpton. I'll hand it over to you now. Uh, thank you. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, I'll probably go a little longer than 20 minutes. I think we have a 40 minute session. I'll try to get through this as quickly as I can. Um, but just wanted to thank uh, Vince and the organizers for the opportunities opportunity to share this morning. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay and see my screen. Um, I was asked to um, talk about the current talk about current research in genomics and health equity. And of course, my worst nightmare came true this morning. The entire session this morning essentially covered the vast majority of what I will talk about. Um, I, I guess I'll just get the opportunity to use, uh, you know, this time to provide, you know, some of my own perspective around some of the, the, the things that were discussed this morning. Um, I think, you know, you know, the time is now. Um, you know, the, in terms of looking at the United States, it's predicted to be ma minority majority by 2045. So as a, as a country continues to become more and more diverse, addressing these uh, uh, healthcare inequities uh, will be critical towards um, uh, improving overall outcomes uh, in the US. Some states are already minority majority. Uh, and uh, so this could actually happen even sooner than this. We've talked about some of the complexities this morning and uh, of this topic as we think about health health equity, um, uh, and it being such a broad term and encompassing a, a, a variety of components, including structural uh, and social um, uh, 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 components. As we think about uh, social, environmental exposures, access to care, uh, socioeconomics, as we consider financial toxicities, payment, and reimbursement. I think LSAO uh, uh, brought some of that up uh, and, and these uh, issues uh, that play a significant role in <clears throat> health uh, uh, equity or inequities. And so how can there be health equity if there's no real equity, right? So we, we have to stand on the fact that the long lasting detrimental impact of persistent and pervasive structural racism is at the core of healthcare inequities. Uh, we also have to consider financial imbalances, you know, regardless of race, um, as we consider, con, uh, consider pers uh, persistent poverty in urban and or rural areas, uh, regardless of race. We think about Appalachia uh, and, and other areas in the United States or uh, 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 urban, uh, urban areas, uh, the structural uh, uh, and the, 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 uh, the, the, the impact of these environments. Uh, on healthcare inequities uh, in terms of the, the food deserts, the, um, the, the lack of, of quality healthcare in these, in these areas. Uh, so we have to consider you know, all of these issues when thinking about healthcare inequities. I know a number of individuals are participating in the workshop. Also, we're part of a congressionally commissioned progress report on cancer health disparities through the AACR. Uh, and in our title, we did consider racial and ethnic minorities and other underserved populations. Uh, We've also heard about um, you know, other, other uh, groups such as uh, dis, uh, individuals with disabilities, um, adolescent and adults. Uh, there are a number of these groups that um, serve as underserved populations and we have to consider them in these discussions as well. But of course, you know, the, 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 at, the, at the core and, and center of a lot of these discussions are um, the uh, ethnic and racial uh, disparities that we see uh, in, in, in uh, many areas in healthcare. 
And so, of course, there's health equity or inequity and health disparities, right? And we know that these things go hand in hand by where health inequity uh, will likely lead to or exacerbate health disparities. So achieving health equity should help lead to the reduction and or elim elimination of health disparities. Uh, so they go hand in hand. There was also some discussion in the chat I was perusing uh, about, you know, why are we focusing on race? It's, it's all about wealth. And well, you know, th th there's a strong relationship and correlation, there, right? As we look at um, uh, uh, family wealth, you know, across several decades, uh, looking at uh, significant growth when we consider whites and, and, and flat uh, uh, rates considering Blacks and Hispanic Latinos and a growing gap. Uh, and then even for some disparities, uh, contextual disparities, uh, even when you correct for uh, socioeconomics within groups, right, we can see differences in outcomes across groups. So it is a part of the issue, but it's not the only issue. So genetics, right? Where, where does genetics come into play? Um, and and, and we, we know that genetics is sort of a, bi is a biological context. I, you know, I don't want to digress too much, but I was in a, a major meeting recently and, you know, someone sort of, you know, sort of challenged me, that, you know, disparities are not about biology. Uh, and then went on to say, well, I know that there are differences in genetics, <laughs> but genetics is not biology. I think everybody's face kind of looked weird, but um, you know, genetics is at the core of, bio, of biology. And if there are going to be genetic alterations um, that perturb phenotype um, or lead to uh, detrimental conditions, then those genetics um, uh, uh, are, are going to tune the biology in such a way that leads to these diseases and these conditions. Uh, so that we know that this is also rooted largely in the degree of the underlying genetics of various individuals and uh, in large part related to uh, geographic uh, genetic ancestry, uh, which has uh, been generally tuned by, by hundreds of thousands of years of natural selection. Uh, and this can be continental or regional, uh, whether we, we look at or think about sickle cell anemia as a disparity, right? We know that that, that was you know, based on natural selection. In one environment, those individuals uh, were able to live to the age to reproduce, uh, you take them out of that uh, malaria infested environment and now they have a disease. Um, and so a lot of the underlying genetics can be tied to natural selection uh, uh, that's related to geographic ancestry, again, continental and or regional. And so for the sake of this pr presentation, I'll be focusing uh, somewhat on major underrepresented minority groups, African-Americans, Hispanic, Latinos, we know about Native uh, uh, or American Indians as well. Um, I also understand the broad perspective of heterogeneity across these populations as have been discussed by, you know, Eliseo and, and, and Esteban, that when you think of these populations, Hispanic Latinos and even African-Americans, um, uh, that, that there's broad heterogeneity across these groups. Um, uh, and so I fully appreciate that um, these broad categories uh, are representative of very, diverse, of very diverse groups of people. Uh, and so relative to these po populations, uh, I think there is both a racial context and an ancestral context. Um, I think at the heart of this discussion is again, population genetics, uh, extracting the and categorizing specific genetic variation that can help to distinguish uh, ancestral groups, particularly as pertains to trunk populations, African European, uh, uh, American Indian uh, and or Asian and um, preaching to the choir because many of the individuals participating in this workshop were among the pioneers uh, that identify these variants and uh, develop the tools that allow us um, to deduce uh, genetic ancestral proportion uh, in individuals and across populations. After the, uh, some of that initial seminal work uh, in this area was done, a number of large initiatives such as the Human Genome Project, HapMap, and Thousand Genomes, uh, just to name a few, uh, have, have allowed us to begin to characterize uh, the large degree of human variation uh, in the context of con continental and regional and or local ancestry. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I think many of us are now going to be somewhat interested in, you know, what, what the, the new lost 400 million bases that were recently revealed uh, uh, will provide in terms of our uh, um, uh, increased understanding of, of ancestry. Uh, we know that these ancestral informative markers or AIMS are now known and can be genotyped or extracted from sequencing data. To provide, to provide an accurate measurement of ancestral proportions uh, for a given individual or individuals from various populations uh, uh, using uh, what are now industry standard um, uh, tools. Uh, and these data can be used in various ways. Um, 
we have uh, Ancestry.com just to understand your ancestry. Uh, and, and we know that these uh, genetic variants are also um, used a lot in research to uh, better understand uh, relationships and correlations uh, between individuals, populations, uh, uh, and various uh, conditions and diseases. Uh, this is some. This is sort of nostalgic. There are a lot of different ways I could show this. Principal components of uh, 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 graphs, uh, but uh, for for some of some of the older folks in the house, remember, remember the hat map and how some of the genetic variants were um, uh, identified and genotyped across different uh, um, populations: uh, the European, the Han Chinese, the Japanese from. Uh, 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 the Japanese populations from Tokyo and the Yoruba uh, from Ibadan. And what we could see in these pie charts, looking at the two different genetic alleles at any given uh, marker, we could see the differences uh, in allele frequencies across these populations. This is just an example of, of these uh, ancestral informative markers and how we can use these to uh, better understand ancestral proportions in, in, in individuals. But as has been discussed, we know that you know, there's this race, this race and this an ancestry, and they do represent different but related uh, factors. And I think we've, we've had the conversation about race and self-identification. The story of Rachel Dolezal is four white grandparents who essentially considers herself an African-American woman um, or individuals who might have 25% uh, African ancestry, but 75% European ancestry and consider themselves European, right? So, so this whole con concept of, of self-identification and race, and then the social context around race, where we do know that individuals, like individuals, will sometimes congregate together and build communities together, so that you have individuals with, who, who may have more similar uh, ancestral proportions living in similar uh, uh, environments or communities and, and, and conditions and being impacted uh, by those con conditions, so that there will be a, a, a relationship between the ancestry as well as the racial and the social construct uh, 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 that's been developed around those communities. And so I think a number of us have various iterations of, of, this, of this slide um, uh, as we think about social uh, and, and societal versus biological and genetic. And I used to have uh, verses and I've modified this to, to have and here, right? So, so the social and the biological. So as we think about race and ethnicity and the social determinants of health, uh, the, the social construct that impact health uh, uh, inequities and, and health disparities, and then the genetic ancestry and how uh, natural selection and variation at, at the genetic level can also uh, impact disease incidence and or outcomes. But we know that these two things interact uh, as they impact host biology uh, or, or conditions. So we know the disparities in incidence and outcomes exist for a number of diseases and conditions, the chronic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular, uh, pulmonary disorders, and cancer. Um, we, we can't ignore these differences. We think about uh, um, uh, diabetes and, and uh, higher rates among uh, American Indians, Hispanics, and Blacks. Uh, we consider heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and the higher rates among Blacks. And we look at various forms of cancer, men and women, and, and the significant disparities, particularly among Black men, uh, across various tumor types, uh, uh, not so much in women. This is an uh, interesting sex-related uh, uh, issue and, and could lead to some interesting uh, observations and, and questions here as well. But we know that there are various factors are influencing these disparities, again, including those extrinsic factors, societal, diet, lifestyle, and possible interest, interest, intrinsic factors such as genetics. Uh, and ancestry. And many of us uh, have been exploring these disparities, particularly among African Americans, Hispanic Latinos. So as we consider these common diseases and, and the, the age of the GWAS and now the age of PRS in the hopes of creating these precision uh, 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 prevention and precision uh, detection uh, approaches, uh, utilizing uh, uh, polygenic risk scores, which is touched upon this morning by Nancy and part of, of, of the other discussions this morning, uh, but also you know, the context around the, the dearth of representation as we think about the cohorts that have been uh, uh, utilized for these studies where the vast majority of individuals in many of these large Chihuahua studies are of European uh, ancestry or European descent and uh, very small percentages when you consider individuals of, Af of, of uh, Black or African ancestry or Hispanic, Latino or native uh, um, uh, heritage. Just want to walk through a few vignettes here. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this was a really cool study. I think Charles Otimi, who's a 
uh, at NHGRI was a part of the study. There are a lot of large uh, PRS studies that have been published, but I really like this one, uh, which was looking at polygenic uh, uh, risk prediction and type 2 diabetes in Africa. And they were able to utilize a really large uh, uh, cohort of meta-analysis of over 200,000 cases and a million controls. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, uh, where, by where a subset were, um, were white or European and a subset were uh, black or African, uh, uh, African American. And they generated PRS from the entire multi-ethnic cohort from just the African American individuals and just the European individuals. And we're able to show that although the discriminatory ability was uh, uh, similar for the African American and the multi-ethnic uh, generated PRS, the African American derived PRS was more transferable and generalizable across multiple Sub-Saharan African populations. And at the 10th decile, where you have fewer SNPs, but a, a greater increased risk, um, you could detect a 3.6 fold increase in risk and uh, disease was detected at uh, almost three years earlier uh, when using the African American uh, uh, PRS uh, when you compare it to the first decile. So again, utilizing a multi ethnic cohort deriving PRS uh, from from very specific populations and then using those and showing that when you tune these PRS appropriately, you can get more power. And that's opposed to this really interesting study by from the practical, where they uh, uh, created what they call a polygenic risk uh, uh, in a multi ethnic and multi ethnic population. So the practical consortium, again, largely European data set. And when they validated this PRS and uh, about 80,000 um, uh, uh, individuals, 71, 72,000 of which were European, right? You can see that although um, you could predict risk in all populations, European, Asian, and African, you could see that the performance was much lower uh, uh, in, the, in the African individuals. And when trying to use these PRS, uh, this 46 variant PRS, to uh, um, uh, predict uh, aggressive disease, um, there was again uh, a positive hazard ratio, but twofold uh, less compared. Uh, so this was K one being the uh, being European, two being uh, African, and uh, then the admixed. You could see that the the performance was much lower uh, when you looked at the, uh, um, the prediction of risk in, in uh, um, African American or African Black um, uh, prostate cancer cases. So again, by not tuning the PRS appropriately, you see poor overall performance. I think another area that's been, uh, there's been a lot of work, well, you asked me to present, right? I do a lot of work in cancer. Uh, it's probably my primary area of investigation. Uh, and there's been a lot of progress in this area. NHGRI had a huge role in um, the um, uh, uh, cancer uh, genome atlas study of the TCGA where uh, over uh, roughly 12,000 individuals were profiled across, um, I think, 33 different tumor types, and the compendium of somatic alterations were revealed across uh, many of these tumor types uh, for the first time. Um, but what we know is that there was also limited diversity uh, in, in these data sets, uh, despite many of these tumor types that, uh, demonstrating significant disparities in incidence and outcomes, prostate, triple negative breast, colorectal, endometrial leukemia, multiple myeloma. And the important thing here is that when you try to to, to generate statistically significant results. Um, all of these, um, most of these groups are under significantly underpowered to identify mutation uh, differences at five or 10%. Uh, an MD PhD student at USC, McKenzie Postal uh, has been working with us uh, and looking at two large genomic studies, TCGA and our Orion data set, which also has about 12,000 uh, somatic uh, uh, profile cancer cases and looking at TCGA um, uh, and looking specifically at race, seeing that the vast majority of individuals were, were, um, were white, um, you have 9% Black or African American, 6% uh, uh, Asian. When we look at the Native American or Hispanic, it's, it's almost nil. Uh, and then when you, of course, when you look at uh, ethnicity, uh, considering Hispanic, Latino, or Hispa uh, uh, Hispanic uh, uh, ethnicity, you can see that, um, you know, again, only 4%, the vast majority were not Hispanic white. So in spite of that, investigators uh, did take that data set, the TCGA data set, and deduced genetic ancestry from all of the individuals, and then looked at somatic mutation profiles uh, in the context of self-identified race and genetic ancestry. And there were some really interesting outcomes from that study that showed that we looked at certain tumor types, such as breast, head, neck, endometrial cancer. Um, uh, tumors derived from African-Americans exhibited higher levels of chromosomal instability. Uh, they had uh, higher frequencies of P53 mutation and cyclone E amplification, uh, and lower absor uh, observed frequencies and genomic alterations uh, within the uh, PI3 kinase AKT pathway. 
Uh, and so, so despite the lack of, of diversity, you know, we, we still see differences, right? When we look at the, the, the uh, uh, composition of somatic alterations and tumors derived from individuals across different groups. You know, our group uh, performed a really large study, one of the largest single cancer studies. We looked at over 700 multiple myeloma tumors uh, generating somatic whole exome, uh, normal tumor sequencing whole exome and RNA sequencing data on um, 700 uh, myeloma patients, uh, uh, of, of which about 125 were African-American and over 500 were European. And I, I bring this up because multiple myeloma is a relatively rare tumor type, but one of the most significant cancer health disparities, uh, both in, in terms of incidence, where it ranks second, uh, and in terms of, uh, of mortality rates, where it's fourth among men and second among women. So multiple myeloma is, uh, rep has represented one of the most significant cancer disparities. And um, I, I think that the outcomes or the, the, the mortality difference is one that's really interesting. I think we were able to provide some uh, clarity uh, as to uh, the factors likely influencing those outcomes. We were able to deduce genetic ancestry from all of our cases from the germline data to reveal the somatic, uh, com the compendium of somatic mutations across myelomas in African Americans and European uh, uh, cases, and then identifying uh, that one of the most well known cancer genes, T50, TP53 mutation frequencies, were significantly higher in tumors from whites. And when we looked at genetic ancestry, wild type versus mutant, we can see that the vast majority of, of, of individuals whose tumors har that harbored P53 alterations uh, had uh, over 90% European ad, uh, ancestry, which sort of bucked the dogma in terms of outcomes as P53 loss is associated with poor outcome in myeloma, but it's enriched among uh, <laughs> European cases. So these data could suggest that African-American patients may have tumors that have molecular features associated with more favorable outcome. So if, if African-Americans were to receive equal treatment, we might see equal or better outcomes. And that's exactly what we're starting to see clinically uh, by where studies uh, uh, looking at outcomes using these new drug uh, classes of drugs, the immunomodulatory agents and the proteasome inhibitors, we're seeing significant increase in overall uh, of five-year survival rates among African-Americans that's exceeding that of whites. And so in multiple myeloma, we could be you know, seeing that the difference in outcomes or, 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 or mortality rate is socioeconomics and access to, to, to therapeutics, but it doesn't explain the difference in incidence. Right, so we still have other op opportunities to explore, and there could be more of a biological context to the disparity in incidence. It could be the rate of, of the pre-malignant lesions and the conversion of full-blown myeloma, immunological factors, germline, genetic risk, environmental exposures, or some combination of the above. So we think we figured out the incidence, uh, 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 I mean, the, the, the mortality rate uh, disparity is probably socioeconomics and access to care for myeloma. So we can probably fix that, right? Hopefully, um, uh, but we still need to explore um, the, the, the disparities and in incidents uh, in this disease. And over the last 20 years, it's been a, an, an explosion of studies in this area where we're consistently uh, uh, identifying differences in tumors derived from individuals across populations with real therapeutic and translational uh, consequences. We consider a uh, ALL, pediatric ALL, uh, uh, prostate cancer, lung cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer, uh, and prostate cancer. And so just a few additional uh, thoughts, I think some of the other important implications when considering genomics and disparities, some of this has been touched upon, some maybe not, but the therapeutic toxicities and drug metabolism, right? And, and differences across groups that might be associated with, with biology, right? Or race and the social construct or genetics, the under, underlying genetics. Also clinical genetics and the false discovery rates around uh, VUS uh, and, and the difference in incidence penetrance of sequelae. So we think about, for instance, retinopathy and diabetes or end-stage renal disease uh, uh, associated with uh, uh, disparities in hypertension. So our understanding of population genetics, mostly defined by AIMS, will be critically important in not just understanding disparities, but how to best approach disease prevention, detection, and treatment. As such, uh, if an AIM or series of AIMS is associated with a phenotype, at least to me, I would no longer consider it an AIM, but I would consider it a biomarker. Right? And I think this type of nomenclature is far more amenable clinically right, than trying to use these differences in race or ancestry. If something is associated with a, a phenotype or a difference, let's call it a biomarker. 
And so that being said, we know that these two things continue to play together. I'm really excited about these new study designs. I'm hoping Shanita uh, uh, Hughes-Halbert talks about some of the amazing work she's doing. We're really trying to understand the impact of structural racism and social determinants and the, on the environmental exposures, the social ex uh, stressors and conditions and the built environment and how they impact physiology. Right, uh, the, the, the uh, epigenetic changes, transcriptional changes, the work that Nancy uh, talked about this morning, uh, protein modifications, lipid modifications, and other, uh, other physiologies such as chronic inflammation, right, and how these drive towards uh, uh, the increase in pathways that impact disease uh, incidence and progression. In this case, I'm talking about the, the hallmarks of cancer, but this could be replaced by pathways associated with various uh, uh, chronic diseases. Other considerations we've touched on, workforce, and that's broadly, in healthcare, in research, in training uh, 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 as well, uh, international collaborations, uh, biorepositories and access to diverse patient cohorts and data sets, diverse model systems for validations, uh, uh, and the application of advanced genomic technology, so moving beyond exomes and RNA-seq and moving into single cell and, and spatial uh, approaches to assess macro and micro environment as we think about the, the heterogeneity that exists in these diseases, how can we utilize a tool such as single cell uh, uh, RNA sequencing to look at the, 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 the composition of, of white cells or the composition of PBMCs across individuals at different stages of development across different populations and how that the genetic in, uh, ancestry can impact those differences and also uh, spatial differences and looking at cancer, identifying these hallmark pathways that are spatially related <clears throat> just a very specific <clears throat> um, physiological feature of cancer cells and how we can show that that type of physiological cancer cell is enriched in tumors derived from African-American patients versus Caucasian patients. I'll be presenting some of this uh, at AECR in the coming days. So finally, significant progress has been made. I think all things being considered. Uh, we know that there's a dearth in diverse cohorts available for study. Uh, and we can't just think about getting hitting numbers that, that are, uh, meet the census proportions, right? We need to think about oversampling in these populations, especially for these diseases that disproportionately impact um, underrepresented minority populations. Um, there have been numerous studies published in high impact journals in spite of these limitations. 20 years ago, there were few or none. So I look back and I remember Rick and I started the AHPC study back in 1996. And there was literally nothing happening in that space. And now we're seeing papers and in, in, in cell nature, uh, you know, cancer cell, cancer discovery, high impact journals showing that these differences do exist. Do the appropriately powered studies. We need to perform these studies. <clears throat> we need to build the models, generate the ev evidence, and then we can change policy because policy will only change when we generate the appropriate evidence. And then finally, my hope is that we can tackle these big issues, right? And as we do it, we not only make sure that everyone has access to standard care, but that as we, as we better define the relationship between genomics and disease disparities, that everyone has access to the most precision care, right? Possible, such that disease management is most tailored uh, to each individual appropriately. And just this final slide, we had a, 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 a workshop as we're considering a business, business model to approach cancer health equity. And uh, there were individuals from academia, industry, government. And the interesting thing, probably 150 people, we had a very active chat going. And I, I, I suggested that we create a word cloud from the chat. And this is the result of that word cloud. The most significant word utilized was community. I think for us to really move this forward, we have to continue to engage the community. Right. If we're really going to address health equity and utilize genomics in the appropriate way uh, as one of the means uh, to, to move towards uh, health healthcare equity, we have to do a better job of engaging the community. So I'll stop there. And I don't know if there's time, time if there's time for questions, but thanks. There is time for questions. Your timing is great. And thank you for that really um, interesting uh, presentation. Um, I want to encourage folks to uh, ask their questions in the chat, and we'll make sure um, 
that we have time um, for Dr. Carpton to answer. I did want to start with a with a question, my own question to you, Dr. Carpton. Um, you know, you you pointed out that the performance of PRS scores is variable across uh, populations, but yet you showed pretty robust evidence that um, comparisons between groups, at least in your your line of research, um, is possible. Um, and then you mentioned um, using aims as a as a classification or as a descriptor, um, as opposed to race and ancestry. I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Like how, first of all, the rationale, and then how would that be operationalized in research? Well, uh, yeah, I think, and, and I'm assuming you're 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 mentioning sort of my comment that sort of we have we have ancestral informative markers, right? Aims. Right, and and the context of that of that genetic variant is ancestry informative. Correct. Um, I'm just saying that if that ancestry ancestry informative marker or aim becomes associated with a significant with significantly with a phenotype, right? Let's say it's associated with increased risk, uh, or it's associated with drug metabolism differences. I would say that at that point, it's a biomarker. Right. It yes, it's enriched in a specific population, and that's why it's considered an ancestry informative marker. But an individual could self-identify as Hispanic Latino race, but have a high proportion of African ancestry if they're from the Dominican Republic. Right. So instead of calling it an ancestral informative marker at that point, let's call it a biomarker of drug metabolism, right? Because it will be impactful across. All, all populations, but yes, it will be in, enriched in certain populations. So I just think that as we talk about, and I, I can't remember, I think it was Esteban that used the, the term, you know, ancestry, I mean, a race, race defined versus, you know, race informed, right? Um, I, I think that we, we can get away from, from, in using genetics and ancestry, we can get away from race and we can possibly get away from ancestry, right? And just focus on the fact that that variant is associated with a phenotype and now it's a biomarker. I see. So um, that's very helpful. And I, and I guess my question would be then um, ancestry, you're trying to get at the admixture. Is that right for, for, the, for the AIMS, using AIMS instead of ans genetic ancestry? You're trying to get at the ad admixture, but there will be, there could be certain, let's, let's take prostate cancer, for instance. Um, there are genetic variants at the AQ24 region, right, that are strongly associated with the increased risk of prostate cancer across groups. The interesting fact though, that is many of those variants are enriched in sub-Saharan African populations. And I use the word enriched, right? Meaning they're more common, they're more frequent there, but does that mean that they're, they're, that they're only in individuals who might consider themselves African-American or black or, right? I mean, there could be an individual who has 25% African ancestry, right? 75% European ancestry, right? And, and contain that genetic variant at AQ24. So that person may self-identify as white, but that genetic variant is informative for their risk of developing prostate cancer. So at my point, those markers become biomarkers of increased risk of prostate cancer and not just aims, right, or ancestral informative markers. Because again, we, we, continue, we, we continue to throw in race, we continue to throw in ancestry, which are terms that can kind of separate, right? At the end of the day, if something is associated with a phenotype, right, a biological contextual feature, right, it's a biomarker at that point. Interesting. Yeah, I would love uh, for folks uh, in the in the room to weigh in on um, on this approach. Um, it's very provocative. Uh, we do have a question from Dave Kaufman, um, and I'm going to read it, but I also would invite him to, to add um, as he likes. Uh, so he asks, um, or he states, you know, PRS would seem to represent multiple pathways leading to disease, and many of those pathways represent the effect of exposures uh, to multiple known risk factors where they are known. Um, so some of these non-genetic factors are social determinants of health related to inequities in the same phenotypes. When evaluating the power of a PRS, is it important to adjust for often easily measurable known non-genetic risk factors, including social determinants of health? 
If we don't, is the PRS partially a proxy measure for a uh, proxy measuring the effects of known exposures? So that was a long question. I, I no, no, it's a it's a great question. Yeah. Um, and I'll I'll extend it. I think I think I think absolutely right. But I, and I also think there there are other clinical um, um, there's additional clinical context that could be added as well. Um, you think about PRS for prostate cancer, right? You 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 might also want to consider family history. You might also want to consider PSA uh, 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 trends and 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 values, right? But absolutely, I think there, there's undoubtedly an interplay between the social construct and ancestry. I, absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, individuals who may have the same underlying genetic ancestral risk factors, right, living in different environments actually may have different, uh, uh, um, um, you know, levels of risk, uh, risk of disease initiation and, and risk of disease progression. Uh, and and poor and poor overall outcomes. So I, I tend to agree. I know that the, the, there were the two New England Journal papers, one saying throw race out, uh, and then others coming in and saying let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I hate that phrase, just like I hate devil devil's advocate. Um, uh, but uh, lack of a better phrase, we have to keep all of this information in context. Uh, and my belief is that as we build the appropriate models and do perform the appropriate studies, generate the data. Right, we can then develop the models that will help us best uh, determine risk in a more precision way. Right, I think this whole term precision medicine came on the heels of what was originally genomic medicine, um, uh, by where we would sequence or utilize information from the genome, right, to help understand, um, uh, uh, you know, clinical management or help, you know, better perform clinical management. But at the end of the day. Um, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of additional context in play to ensure that we, that we apply the most precision approach to healthcare. And I do believe that social construct, the social determinants of health are, will be critically important in understanding disease risk uh, uh, in terms of uh, risk of, of initiation and progression. Okay, great. So we, we have a question from Anandi Krishnan um, who asks, do you feel that we still have gaps in engagement between investigators from disparate disciplines and here in parentheses, cancer, clinicians, immunologists, social scientists, genomicists to address these equity disparity questions? And if so, what are some strategies you suggest for the next generation of investigators to come together? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I've been at this for about 30 years now. Uh, and I'll tell you, it, there's a stark difference um, from where things were 30, 30 years ago from where they are today, uh, where the social scientists would hold their meetings and say, it's all social science. And the biologists and geneticists would hold our meetings and we'd say, it's all genomics and genetics. But there were always those individuals who understood that it was multifactorial. And we've seen a growing cadre of, of, of individuals playing in that space. <clears throat> Again, you're gonna hear from a number of them uh, uh, over the course of the next couple of days. Um, where the gap has definitely begun to close. Um, how do we get there? Um, policy funding mechanisms, right? Funding mechanisms that, that in, incentivize, right? The integration uh, across disciplines, the creation of multidisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary teams uh, to, to, to ask the right questions, uh, design the right studies, uh, so that we can most effectively um, uh, find the solutions to these um, uh, health disparities and uh, towards towards achieving health healthcare uh, uh, equity. So it's a great question. I think we're we're a lot better off today than we were 30 years ago. Um, but I would love to see continued funding uh, uh, in this area. Uh, and um, I, I really do believe that we're we're heading in that direction. We now have the the National Institute for Minority Health and Health uh, uh, Disparities under LSEO's leadership. Uh, which started off as an office, and I watched it go from an office to a center to an institute. Uh, and uh, between the, you know that IC and other ICs across campus, NCI and others, NHGRI, uh, I really would love to see the continuation of, of RFAs and, and funding announcements and mechanisms that focus on incentivizing integration across disciplines. Great. Um, so we do have a question from Ebony Madden, um, and um, she's asking, you know, can you expand on, on your comment 
um, to, that we, we should just not, um, not only achieve cohorts that reflect the US population, but there's a need to oversample uh, when investigating diseases that might affect underrepresented populations. And, and I'll add, how do, we, how do we go about that, given what we know about uh, who is actually um, signing up for research? Yeah, no, that, that's <clears throat> that's a great question. I, you know, it's it's funny. I think you know we we have gotten to the place to where, you know, we feel good, right? If we think we we can get to twelve percent or ten percent African Americans in a study, hey, we're we're close to the the census proportions. We we did it. Um, but if a disease disproportionately affects that particular group, I really firmly believe that we should oversample in order to ensure that we have appropriate statistical. A uh, 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 power, right? When we're when we're um, uh, uh, you know when we're describing our results and when we're gener generating those results, um, so I really do believe that we have to oversample because there could be additional heterogeneity hidden in that information, right? And 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 again, it goes to power, right? When you think about identifying differences at one percent versus five percent versus ten percent, <clears throat> we will need to oversample in some cases. Uh, I was on a call the other day with Doug Lowy. I think it was a day before he knew he was going to become the interim uh, NCI director, but I was just on a call with Doug and, and he agreed totally. Actually, actually he was the one who said it um, and he agreed, he agreed totally, right? That we need to think about oversampling. Um, just, re just getting to those proportions is not good enough. Understanding where we are with those proportions. And, and especially as we think about Hispanic Latinos, given the broad heterogeneity across that group, as has been mentioned, from, from, from European mestizo all the way through um, uh, native various, right, American Indian uh, uh, components, all the way to the, the Afro-Caribbean uh, where you, we have Puerto Rico, Dominican, where individuals are, uh, have, you know, upwards of, you know, 40, 50, 60% African uh, ancestry. So I, I think that we have to consider oversampling uh, in order to ask the right questions and answer them appropriately. And then finally, to your question, uh, uh, Sandra, how do we get there? Um, we get there through funding. Right. I mean, let's let's just be real. I don't I don't even know why we're even right. It, it, it's money. It's funding. Right. It's resources. The people who want to do this are here. <laughs> the people who know how to do this are here. I remember when there was a time when cohorts were being created and there was there was a shutdown when individuals were trying to come together and say, let's generate a large cohort of African-American prostate cancer cases It was shut down. Right. And, and so, so, so it, it's, it's in, you know, it's, it's funding, right? We, we can write the proposals, we can generate the studies, we can design the studies, we can perform the research, right? But we can't do it without funding. We can identify the cases, both, both nationally and internationally, right? We can do all of the work, but it requires funding to get there. Yeah, I think that's an excellent note for us to end on. Thank you so much, Dr. Carpton, for, for a great talk and a wonderful discussion. Uh, now we're going to move uh, to our panel, our final panel of the day. Um, this is entitled Identifying Research Gaps and Opportunities, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, that our three panelists as well as our moderator. So we will first hear from Dr. Rick Kittles. Dr. Kittles is a professor and founding director of the direct, uh, Division of Health Equities within the Department of Population Sciences at City of Hope. He is also Associate Director of Health Equities in the Comprehensive Cancer Center. His research has focused on understanding the complex issues surrounding race, genetic ancestry, and health disparities. And over the last 20 years, he has been at the forefront of the development of ancestry-informative genetic markers and how genetic ancestry has been quantified and utilized in genomic studies on disease risk and outcomes. Next, uh, we will hear from Dr. Lauren Salisbury. Uh, Dr. Salisbury is an assistant professor in health policy and health services research in the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Chicago. Her research studies pharmacogenomics and how to guide its implementation in a manner that advances health equity within genomic medicine. She is currently pursuing this work as part of an NHGRI Career Development Award. She is the Assistant Program Leader of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program within the University of Chicago uh, Medicine Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Assistant Director of Diversity Studies within the University of Chicago Center for Personalized Therapeutics. 
Uh, our third panelist is Dr. Michael Inouye. Dr. Inouye is a computational biologist who has been analyzing human genome data for more than 20 years. He is the director of research in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care at the University of Cambridge the Munz Chair of Cardiovascular Prediction and Prevention at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Australia, and Director of the Cambridge Baker Systems Genomics Initiative. And then finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shanita Hughes-Halbert uh, from the University of Southern California. Dr. Hughes-Halbert is the Associate Director for Cancer Equity at the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center and a Professor and Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Population and Public Health Sciences at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Her research is aimed at reducing the disparities in cancer outcomes that affect patients from underrepresented communities with primary focus on African-American communities, she identifies social, cultural, psychological, genetic, and environmental determinants of cancer health disparities and translates this information into interventions to improve health equity among racially and ethnically diverse populations. Um, I'm going to hand it over uh, to uh, Dr. Kittles. All right, thanks. Thanks, Sandra. Um, seems like uh, we're, we're always at the same meeting, huh? <laughs> so. Um, uh, let me see, where do I start? Uh, I have um, uh, several, um, well, let me, let me just rephrase it. I have strong sort of affinities with uh, um, Esteban's uh, comments earlier today. Um, and being a, um, uh, a researcher of color, um, we sort of have had um, an interesting journey and insight that has brought us to um, where we are today. So, so my, my comments today are just gonna really just talk about some of the fears and hopes as we, as we enter into this space of genomics and health equity. Um, and, uh, and I'll tell a, a couple of interesting stories that you might find uh, insightful as we, as we talk about this, uh, uh, this journey. Um, you know, uh, early on, you know, this whole discussion around disparities and, and, and health equity. But I, I think we all have to be honest and, 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 real, and realize that disparities and, and health overall in the United States is really due to two major contributors, poverty and, and, and racism. And um, while, you know, many of these diseases are, are genetic, um, uh, those differences that we see in incidence and mortality, for the majority of these disparities, have a, a very little to do with, with, with genetics. Um, but I will tell you, I study one of those diseases that uh, where there is a strong genetic underpinning and, and, and I've been um, very vocal about it. Uh, uh, I'm trying to understand uh, the role genetics is playing uh, in, in prostate cancer. Um, I, I loved uh, Nancy, Nancy Cox's um, uh, volcano plots earlier today where, where um, she, you know, she, she, most of those phenotypes were cardio, cardiovascular phenotypes. But if we were to put prostate cancer on, on that um, uh, uh, genetic ancestry um, associated um, where they can, she controlled for race, prostate cancer would be high on, on, that, on, that, on that plot. Um, and, you know, it, it's an area where we, we do know that there's some strong genetic um, underpinnings. Um, and, and I think that's where um, a lot of the um, uh, attention and action when we talk about genetics and genomics in, in health equity should be. I mean, we should, we should try to understand race and, and, and genetic ancestry in order to tease apart the, um, the risk factors for these, for these disparities. And if we find out that there is a strong genetic component to it, then we um, um, we, we put some money and effort to try to understand that. Um, but if it's not, then we have to be honest and say, look, you know, maybe we need some behavioral interventions here. Um, uh, and, and I say that because historically, you know, geneticists, and I, and I hope, you know, we don't go in this direction in the health equity space with, with genetics, is that, you know, geneticists have been very trendy. And, and you know, we jump on new technology, you know, we go from um, our, you know, um, um, uh, RFLPs to, to um, uh, microsatellites, to SNPs, to um, sequencing, um, whole genome, exome, uh, um, RNA-seq, 
and and we're we're leveraging new technology, but we're we're asking the same questions, and 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 that's that's the problem that I that I have in this space because we are embracing technology that's really you know state of the art, and I, you know I don't have any problem with the technology, but we're asking the same questions, and and why is that? I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, there's homogeneity in the room. Uh, in the room when questions emerge, in the room where decisions are made about research proposals, in the room where, where RFAs are written, there's not a lot of diversity there. And, and so we end up asking the same questions with this new technology and coming up with um, very little progress in this space. And so what does that progress look like? Well, let me just give you an example of some progress um, historically that, that I've seen. I remember when I was at Howard University and, and um, um, uh, we were trying to do a, um, we were trying to get involved. We had an asthma center, asthma research center. We were trying to get involved with this, um, in this um, clinical trial with this drug company, which I'm not gonna mention. They had this inhalant um, uh, and, and there was some data showing that African-Americans behaved differently. They didn't respond um, similarly. So we wanted to be involved in this. And so I remember calling some of the scientists at, um, uh, at this company, uh, this drug company, and saying, you know, we, we can help recruit African-Americans um, in this trial. And very quickly, they said, oh, well, we, we're unsure about that. We don't, we're not, maybe, you know, we're not really open to in increasing the number of African-Americans because, uh, you know, I said, why? And they said, because African-Americans are dirty. The data is dirty. And uh, there's too much home with heterogeneity. We want clean, we want a clean trial going through the FDA. Now, that would tell you something about when this, how long ago this was, but that was the current state at the time. And, and I remember myself, others, other young investigators on the East Coast, young investigators on the West Coast, we were all actively trying to understand what this dirtiness in the data was. What was this heterogeneity that everybody was so scared to, to touch? because they wanted clean data. And so folks like myself and, and, and Esteban and others at UCSF, we started working on developing ancestry um, informative markers and leveraging that in these studies. That was a bubbling up of, of, of individuals who wanted to study disparities, who didn't have the, 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 the tools and the methodologies to really effectively do it. So we had to do it ourselves. But if we were the same people in the room, it wouldn't have gone as far as it did, I think. And so that's why I think this, this, this workforce diversity piece is critical because bringing more um, attention and more minds in the room will create more um, uh, 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 diversity in ideas. And I think more progress in this field. Well, what, what, are, what are some of the questions we have to answer? The, ro the role of race and racism in, in, um, in, in disparities. And how, when we talk about racism in America, how is that mediated by skin color? We still don't know much about that. That's an area that I think um, uh, we really need um, some attention on because race and genetic ancestry, as, as many have said before, there's a relationship there. In some cases, they have independent, they're independent risk factors. When I say race, I'm talking about this social construct of race, not, the, not a biological race, but there's this, Information there that it carries is a biomarker, as or it's a it's a it's a social social marker, um, uh, as a risk factor. And then there's ancestry, which is itself a, a, um, a risk factor. And then there's this interaction of the two. So so uh, that's an area that I think we really have to um, to to focus on. And then we also have to stop this opportunistic sampling. And I think John mentioned that in his talk. I mean, you know, historically. Um, not historically, but there was a period of time where there was no additional cohorts or, or, or recruitment uh, in African-American and, and Latino populations because NIH just yes. wasn't. Yes. Thank you, uh, Rick. Those are great comments. Um, but we would, I would like to hear from our other panelists. And, you know, we, I, I, I think these are really setting an, an important stage for us to, um, to have our panel discussion. So Lauren, did you want to introduce yourself and give us sort of your reactions to the talk and um, to continue our conversation? Sure, thank you. Just want to make sure uh, everyone can hear me. All right. 
right, seeing some shaking heads. Okay, great. Um, well, it's truly a pleasure to be here today. And uh, as a health policy and health services researcher studying pharmacogenomics, I focus largely on some of the later stages of the translational cycle, um, namely how genetically based prescribing is equitably or inequitably implemented into clinical practice and its implications for underrepresented populations. Uh, Dr. Carpton and others have eloquently discussed today the significance of the dearth of diverse cohorts in genomic studies. And as a part of that, kind of given where my research is situated, I want to emphasize that this dearth of information and lack of representation applies to implementation studies as well in genomic medicine. And this is important because if the goal is to avoid perpetuating and exacerbating health disparities, or even potentially introducing new health disparities, uh, knowledge of the patient experiences of underrepresented populations that are receiving genetically directed health care is especially critical. Patient engagement in genomic medicine is critical um, in our, especially in our decentralized U.S. health system, where patients will be the keepers of their genetic information as they travel from one clinical encounter to another. Um, and we've seen in numerous instances within healthcare where, um, you know, lack of that uh, ability or uh, knowledge and proper communication tools um, to be able to truly be that keeper and carry it across um, a decentralized system can truly affect health outcomes. Um, and communication has been a topic that's come up throughout today's sessions. Um, I can say in the studies that we've completed to date, um, we consistently see um, results that reiterate opportunities in pharmacogenomics clinical trials for improved communications about the role uh, that genomic medicine and personalized care can have for patients, especially during clinical visits where genetic testing might be important for medication decisions. And importantly, those patients across all backgrounds um, that indicate enthusiasm for the promises of personalized care. But we're still seeing differences in the views and the preferences within these underrepresented patient populations that could require tailored approaches, and that those aren't necessarily fully always incorporated into care. With this in mind, I think there are three kind of primary considerations uh, that I would propose for going forward. And first, I'd say, you know, the communication between patients and providers uh, about genomic medicine um, and the type of care that they're receiving that's genetically guided um, definitely merits additional focus. Um, already, we've heard a call for more empirical evidence to better understand the question of what is actually being communicated in the context of these care visits where genetics can be clinically relevant uh, to therapeutic decisions. Decisions. And secondly, um, as has been noted, and I think can't be understated, uh, appropriately delivering genomic medicine, such as pharmacogenomics, to underrepresented and underserved patient populations, especially those who may be at risk for experiencing health disparities, is going to require a better understanding of their life experiences, both within and beyond the health system. Uh, in other words, it, we're going to need a more comprehensive picture of their whole lives that account for both the medical determinants as well as the health-related social, economic, political, and the full range of other factors that influence patient health outcomes. An additional consideration I'll add to that is that germline genetic tests last a lifetime, and they can guide care across therapeutic areas which may not only have ramifications for the individuals undergoing testing, but it can also be meaningful for their family's health. And finally, I'll conclude uh, with the need to ensure our systems and institutions have the resources and infrastructure to promote and support equitable access to and delivery of genomic medicine. This will involve building levers and tools such as appropriate guidelines directing clinical practice. For example, it's come up earlier today about the appropriate use of race in medicine and clinical algorithms that direct, genomic, that direct genomically guided care. Laws that evolve alongside our medical advancements and health policies that regulate the reimbursement for genetic testing and really discovering the types of payment models that will facilitate personalized medicine. Thank you. Great comments. Thank you. And now, Michael. Great. Uh, thanks, Shanita. Um, so uh, I, I don't really have uh, a whole lot to, to introduce uh, about myself. So I'm, I'm kind of an unusual uh, person here in that uh, I am a, a Japanese American um, who has not lived in the US since 2005. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm finding myself sitting here listening to the conversation that's happening and just incredibly uh, impressed 
uh, I have to say, with the level of, uh, of awareness, the consciousness, level of debate, the insight uh, that we're seeing right across the, the entire uh, table, uh, people uh, from the US who are leading this debate uh, on how we use genomics to promote health equity and, and indeed, you know, at least not exacerbate uh, inequity. So I, 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 I see, I, I'd like to say as, as someone sort of a little bit from the outside looking in, but previously inside uh, looking out, um, that, uh, that you're, 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 you're actually leading, I think, the world and, and the debate that you're having here and, and the, the actions that NH, NHGRI in particular takes from here will set an example for the international community. And, um, and I would say, you know, don't lose sight of that. Uh, you'll, you'll tailor to solutions that address the, the inequities in the US and that's entirely appropriate, you know, given the use of US tax dollars. But I, I think don't, don't lose sight of, of the enormous impact that can be had uh, for, you know, the UK, uh, for Australia, for Europe, for Africa, for, you know, uh, Asia, I think, how we how we sort of take the insights and learnings here and and engage, uh, you know, of course, very diverse communities and, and health systems right around the world. Uh, let's let's also keep that uh, front of mind as well. Thank that's you. that's all I've got. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, and thanks everyone for staying for uh, this really important panel discussion. I just like to summarize a couple of key points that I heard, um, both in John's talk and then through the comments made by the panelists. One is um, community. Michael was just talking about the community of scholars um, in the United States and those who are international. Lauren talked about, um, and Rick talked about the communities um, that in which we are we need to be engaged with to advance equity and genomic medicine. Um, I also heard a lot of discussion about the whole person and social determinants of health and then related to that, the importance of ensuring that we have a diverse, a workforce, that there's equity in terms of access to the novel um, strategies and the advancements that are ma made as a result of applying um, genomic and genetic technology to um, diseases in different, way, different ways. Um, I think Rick made really important points about how and where genetics and genomics plays a role um, as it relates to um, the broader systemic issues of poverty and racism. And so, you know, one of the questions or one of the points that I, that I think was really important from John's presentation was that, you know, there's really this intersectionality um, that I, I think has, in my mind, has not really been um, examine with sufficient depth or breadth to really inform um, how we think about um, health equity research and genomics. So with those kind of integrative comments and that framework, I'd like to open it up for the panel discussion. And, and also, um, as, as in our previous session, if you can submit your questions, um, in the chat, what I'll do is is um, is read them and and invite our panelists to uh, respond. I'll start uh, with the question with you know asking each panelist to think through and and share with us your views about um, if an equity framework were applied to all dimensions of genetic research and clinical translation. What um, mechanisms, practices, and expertise are needed? Um, Rick, I'll start with you because you were talking about um, workforce diversity. And um, I think you've done a lot of thinking and work in the space of equity frameworks. Yeah, so I think depending on the, actually it depends on the research question, right? In terms of all the expertise that you'd want um, in, the, in the room or at the table. But um, uh, I, I think we need to move beyond just the, uh, the, the, um, the genetic or uh, technology and the statistical analysis and, um, and really try to dig deep in terms of uh, uh, that health equity uh, framework, which encompasses you know, the, the social determinants and um, uh, the environment, uh, the, the physical and the social environment. And, and, and how that uh, the, how some of these health behaviors interact 
uh, not just with the with the environments, but also with with the genes that you carry. So so I mean, you know, you have to have that level of that diversity or that interdisciplinary um, uh, team uh, to encompass effectively all of those dimensions in that framework, um, because disparities is isn't isn't just driven by genetics. Or, or just the environment. And, and, and so we, we need to understand and, and model that uh, accordingly. Thank you. Lauren, what are your thoughts about that? Yes, thank you. I, I think, you know, I couldn't reiterate more uh, the value, um, at least that I've seen, of team science approaches to these topics. You know, I think Dr. Cox was talking earlier about bringing in social scientists uh, into this discussion and into directing, um, you know, everything from the research question to the study design to the interpretation of the results and, and what the implications then might be for um, different populations. Um, and I think that's going to be critically important. Um, and and from a kind of broader systematic um, standpoint, I think that you know interdisciplinary and multi-sector collaborations are also going to be um, you know critically important there. Um, and I think I just add to that that I think being very clear uh, about for populate for studies that involve multiple populations, you know what what are the population labels that we're using uh, within these investigational studies, um, particularly those that are evaluating health disparities. Um, is it race ethnicity? Is it genetic ancestry? Is it some combined factor of the two. And I think, um, you know, across uh, different uh, types of studies in, in the research and, and biomedical enterprise, we've seen um, that those population labels are not employed um, consistently. And so I think, you know, defining them and, and being very clear about what you're studying um, and, and evaluating whether it's appropriate to the research question. Thank you. And so uh, related to that, you know, when we talk about international health equity efforts, if the U.S. is becoming a leader in this space, um, how can individuals, companies, universities um, continue to contribute to the advancement globally? And Michael, I I'd like to start with you to, to start our conversation about that. It's a, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much that, that can be done. I'll, I'll maybe tackle it from an area where, where I'm relatively expert in, uh, and, and that's actually uh, in, in terms of data. So we obviously know that, you know, there's a major sort of data uh, gap, as in like an underrepresentation of various, uh, you know, protected uh, characteristics, various groups. Uh, whether it's, you know, ethnicity or socioeconomic or, you know, those sorts of things. So that area uh, in terms of, you know, how we're missing, you know, data on those individuals and, and are then not able to kind of, you know, train predictive models or, or leverage other sort of genetic, genetic insights uh, into, you know, those groups is, is something that, you know, those sort of people can work together to, to do Better and, and things like the you know the all of us study, uh, which is you know oversampling um, you know, minority uh, ethnicities, is uh, is a pretty good example uh, of uh, of how you know uh, people can come together and, and vary from various sort of you know individuals, institutions, companies that sort of thing can come together and, and do something really good. Um, I'll, I'll caveat that with uh, making it international is, is another step, and obviously. Uh, being based in the UK, uh, you know, UK Biobank is an, is a, uh, I believe, a international exemplar uh, in terms of making data available and 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 usable right around the world, um, with very little restrictions actually, uh, apart from doing you know uh, approved research um, for health. So you know, I, I think that's something that all of us can can really take on board and ensure that the international community. Uh, can also contribute to, you know, the the equity that uh, research that's going on using all of us, um, and and indeed that you know that all of us can help contribute uh, to the uh, you know to helping create uh, or to helping promote you know equity research in other countries uh, as well, and and to do that you know making that data accessible to international uh, researchers will be very important. But that's that's just one angle of a, of a very complicated. Uh, a question. I mean, there's all sorts of things people can do. And I think the one thing that, you know, we, we can really sort of, I think, you know, take on board is raising awareness 
keeping it front of the agenda. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, how equity and, and uh, research has really taken off in the past sort of five, 10 years or so. And the, the challenge will be keeping it there. And if we keep it there front of mind for people, then you know, various uh, good things will happen, connections will happen amongst these groups. And yeah, I'll leave it there. So there's a clarifying question about intersectionality. And you know, this is related to um, sort of how Crenshaw focused on race and gender, emphasizing that they must be considered together because the two create more discrimination um, than they do separately. But I think that it, the question being raised by this uh, in this, the, the issue being raised in this question is, you know, what, um, you know, are we really focusing on identity and, you know, how are we using it within this context? And I think, you know, intersectionality is a really important concept um, as we think about race, ethnicity, and in my mind, I think there are multiple ways to think about and use an intersection, uh, use an intersection, the framework of intersectionality to help us think through these issues. So in my mind, and I'd love to hear the panelists talk about this as well. You know, there's sort of in my, and I, I'll agree with, with what I think I heard John say um, is that, you know, we often kind of had a very siloed approach to thinking about genetics separate from social issues. And I think intersectionality in my mind in this space from, means that, you know, the two um, domains really work together and they, they intersect with one another. So the expression of a genomic marker um, is through a social context. And I think that's, you know, one of the intriguing areas um, in my mind. And one of the ways where I think there's an absence of really thought about, um, you know, how in which, you know, there's this sort of intersectionality among uh, risk factors. Previously, I think it's been depicted in frameworks where it's shown to show this multi-level approach. But, you know, those, if you think in the classic sort of depiction of the social econo ecological framework is really like these, circles that kind of are nested within, within each other. And I guess what I would like to, what I really think is important is to have sort of the, the Venn diagram of understanding um, where and how um, different types of determinants um, intersect. But panelists, what do you guys think about that? I, I agree. Okay. Does anyone disagree? I mean, it's kind of, it's, I think it's a very interesting um, focus for us because, you know, I, you know, as John was talking and as Rick was talking, you know, I, I, we, we all started our careers at relatively the same time and we've seen sort of the progression. So, you know, I can think back to the first sort of multi-level model developed through the Centers for Population Health and Health Disparities. Um, and now there's, you know, the NIMHD research framework, which really illustrates sort of the multi-level um, nature of variables that are important to minority health and health disparities. And now I think we're sort of moving towards this more intersectional approach where we can think of these sort of determinants inter interacting with each other. There's another question in the chat, um, which is about how can students entering this field help to incorporate lessons from those who have studied and promoted equity in genomics during their uh, future career or educational pursuits. So what are the lessons learned? Um, and I, I might start with Rick again, because Rick has been a pioneer in this area. You have a lot of lessons that you might want to, pearls of wisdom that you might want to share. Yeah, I guess the first thing I want to share is for them to finish, <laughs> pass. <laughs> <laughs> it's all null and void after that. But but um, all right. So I I think I think um having having good um mentorship or at least um engaging with folks who have been um around uh, and have seen certain things is important. Um, you may not necessarily agree with everything that people say, but having that that dialogue and that discussion and an understanding of that history um uh, plays a big role. And and it's gonna it's actually actually it's gonna play a big role as we move forward in this in this health equity space around genomics um, because you know we we have to um, you know we, we, we I, I like I like sort of what um, 
uh, Stavon and, and, and several others in this this paper that that was um, written in the New England Journal on the reckoning of racism, you know, and 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 that's where I think things ultimately are going to have to uh, uh, go. Thank you. Other panelists, do you have a response that you'd like to share? Well, I can, you know, speak from uh, you know, both uh, having a, a probably more proximal recollection of what it is to be a student and a trainee and, and now uh, from a faculty person. And I can and definitely say that, um, you know, being, you know, a part of uh, rooms and discussions such as this one, uh, as you are, um, are key, you know, components um, to learning about that and uh, seeking and, and identifying different types of mentors that can guide different aspects of your, you know, scientific inquiry, um, but also your career um, have also been really valuable uh, um, strategies. Thank you. So one of the biggest challenges facing research generally um, raised today is, and more generally overall, is how to enhance engagement and accountability um, with both individuals, but it to enhance engagement and accountability, but it'd be helpful to have some discussion about more specificity about how to achieve this. So how do we achieve um, accountability along with engagement? Holding who accountable? Accountability with who, for who? I mean, I think there are multiple ways to think about accountability. Um, certainly from, you know, my, my first response is accountability among researchers, accountability to the groups that we represent. You know, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, as we talk about community engagement and, um, and the lack of diversity in um, cohorts, you know, the, the question is, well, what, how can we, um, and one of the reasons why that there are barriers and lack of diversity is, is due to um, there not being a clear sense of where and how the results might benefit the communities at risk and the communities that we're working to, that we're serving. So if we think about communities as like one of the, our major stakeholders to whom we would be a, a, an accountable, I mean, how do we, and how do we ensure that? I think I think you know what what's been missing in a lot of this uh, discussion has been the um, the historic value of of minority serving institutions like HBCUs and and the role that they play in our communities and um, uh, in some in many cases in particular with the science and the technology area you know the many of these institutions have been have been left out of that uh, out of that equation and I think. Um, that could uh, play, uh, you know, those institutions could play a big role too in, in the development uh, in the training uh, of, of more um, scientists of color, but then also in the um, community engagement uh, around uh, these issues and the uh, advancement of the science and of, of disparities, because most of them have a commitment, part of their mission is health equity and and dis and disparities and so and understanding disparities so so i i see that as um uh, an area that definitely should be um engaged uh, more okay and sort of a follow-up point michael did you were you going to say something i i guess i i just wanted to add for for accountability it's it's i wanted to actually mention something from the data science perspective, which, which I think is something that the community is struggling with. Uh, and, and it's how do we actually measure ourselves and hold ourselves to account? Um, and, and one of the issues in, in equity research that, that we run into time and again is that there are so many ways of measuring equity and fairness. Uh, you know, how do you actually, like, what do you consider fair in terms of model performance, for example, whether it's a polygenic score or, or, or a risk prediction model, that sort of thing. So, so I, I actually think that we're, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of goodwill, uh, I think, and, and a lot of, especially on, on the part of uh, you know, students and, and, and postdocs, that, that they highly, highly value the city research and rightly so, you know. And, but, but they don't actually have the tools that precede uh, accountability. Um, 
so one of the things that, that I think we need to do is, as a genomics community uh, and you know uh, genomic data science community is to establish you know metrics and, and standards by which we measure ourselves things that are akin to like you know AUC uh, per standard deviation odds ratios etc. There's a there's a fair literature on this, but I, th I think the community does need to come together and uh, and 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 lay down a little bit you know how we should be measuring ourselves and therefore. How do we know whether we're doing well or not? Thank you. And just to reiterate, and there's a lot of agreement with Rick's point about, um, you know, more resources and, and funding being um, focused towards um, HPCUs, which I think is, um, and then just to kind of bring a finer point to that, um, there is a significant role for HPCUs to play in workforce diversity and community engagement relative to genomics and health equity. One of the questions that came up in the in uh, some of the previous chats is, you know, about the overall social system and uh, here in the United States and how we need to think about achieving health equity within that context. Um, so certainly they, you know, we live in a society where, um, you know, there's a very strong discrepancy between the research funding that goes to um, majority academic institutions versus HBCUs. Um, there's also, you know, as we've, you know, we've learned through the COVID-19 pandemic about um, some of the perceptions that are, that are prevalent about science and research. Um, throughout the country. And uh, the, the issue, one of the questions is, and, and you know, we, we don't have, um, and it seems like there's limited support for, for universal health care. So how do we address, you know, the, the broader challenges of equity um, overall? And then how can we, you know, really focus that on uh, achieving equity in genomic medicine? Lauren, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, my approach to this, you know, being a, a student of health policy has always been, um, you know, we definitely have to generate a, a larger and more extensive evidence base. Um, and that is, uh, you know, sometimes challenging work to do, especially with hard, um, complex questions such as the this one. Um, you know, but I, I think that uh, policymakers are, uh, you know, maybe, you know, given current political climate and knowing that this wax and wanes, they have different receptivity um, to evidence and what that means, even kind of the definition of what are, um, you know, facts or, or what is evidence. But I think that as a researcher, I've at least always taken the approach that if you continue to study topics that are timely, that have meaningful implications for people's lives, um, and you continue to disseminate and promote that work, um, that I I've certainly seen that, uh, you know, across uh, different uh, types of circumstances that windows will open uh, for that information to make a meaningful change and shift um, in how uh, practice actually occurs and can, uh, you know, effectively impact what policies are on the agenda and what's being considered. Um, so I think that that, you know, highlights how important this discussion and, um, you know, thinking, you know, strategically and intentionally about how, uh, you know, everyone on this call um, can think uh, through equity in genomic medicine um, is, is incredibly important. Um, and having kind of some of that evidence there uh, that can inform um, where we go from here when those windows open up. Thank you. Any other comments or thoughts from the panel? I, I you know, I, I think about this that question, um, and I think about it in the context of, you know, like precision medicine or, or genomic uh, uh, medicine, or what historically was, you know, um, initially was was termed individualized medicine, and 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 I see the value as a geneticist. I see the value and the promise, um, but you know the the inequities and the structural uh, racism that um, hampers it, it hampers the ability of it to be effective. Um, and 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 create broad um, uh, benefit across across all communities. Um, you know, just just looking at healthcare overall, and I think there was a question in here about um, 
uh, healthcare and health equity, you know, studying, um, we really need to study that. I think that that is a, um, an area that definitely needs to be explored more because just the way that the healthcare system is set up, you know, uh, the, 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 there are these barriers for, for um, disparate communities um, to, to actively and get to be actively be engaged and to participate in the building of better health for themselves and their community. And so how do, how do, we, how do we jump from there to this issue of genomics and precision medicine and think that you know, things are gonna be um, uh, better? Um, that, and so that's, that's the challenge, that's the frustration. That is, because I see the promise, but I don't see once it's implemented it, it, it being done well, because of these structural barriers that have been longstanding um, in the in the healthcare system. So Can with just, that, uh, <laughs> sorry, Shanita, I I just wanted to echo very strongly what what Rick just said about structural inequities in, in the American healthcare system. It it is it is the, it, it, apart from research that is the challenge. That it, it's just completely uh, uh, distorting uh, every research based advance that comes through the pipe. Uh, it, it, this is not a research question, uh, but it's something that surely is is something that's you know needs to happen you know in DC and and you know scientists need to be a part of that conversation. So thinking about some of the priorities that have been that I, I as I see them and and I'd love to hear from the panelists about this, but you know there's been uh, funding opportunities for that 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 have been designed to support research to address structural racism. There's been, um, and this is one that was uh, came out from, that was supported by NIMHD and really, I think some innovative um, proposals, applications were funded as a result of that. Um, similarly, there are, um, you know, there's work now being, you know, developed support to really understand structural racism and how it can be, Mani the manifestations it has within healthcare, within the day-to-day -day lived experiences of people um, in different uh, different settings, both community, clinical, work workforce, and workplace. I guess one of the things that I um, that I, I'm thinking through is, you know, structural racism is really the big, like, fundamental issue. Um, what do we need to do to, to address it? And, you know, how does that relate to the research framework with um, equity and genomics? It's a challenging question. I don't know that I have the answer. Um, anyone want to offer some thoughts? So what's the question again? So the question is, you know, if the, if the main issue, the fundamental issue that's like a barrier for all things and, I, and is structural racism, how do we fix it? How do we address it? There's research being done now to testing some really innovative strategies. Um, but what, what do we need to do next? I, I don't, our, that's a great question. I wonder about some of that, that research though, because you know, especially the, the the funding recently in the direction of these sort of these transformative health equity uh, uh, wards, where you're out there measuring structural racism, and then you're putting in, you're doing implement um, um, the, the interventions or into what am I trying to say? You're implant you're implementing interventions on the community that has suffered from the racism without doing anything to break down the structural racism. And so, you know, I, I wonder sort of, you know, is it going to just continue and we'll just end up with better ways to cope? Hmm. Oh, that's provocative. So what do others think? My, my lived experience uh, overseas is that um, America is not more racist than any other country. Um, shock horror. Uh, and yes, yeah, other countries. <laughs> or just <disturbing. laughs> it's, it's just it's it's just it, it's it's just you know the, the, it has. I, I think you just see it more. Is the thing it gets highlighted more. You know, um, 
whereas in other places it's it's not uh, for various reasons but other places have more equal um, societies and healthcare systems so I, I think structural racism is an extraordinarily important limitation uh, to um, the advances that we can make as you know as medical researchers and, and genomicists um, but it, it's it's not something that's going to stop us from from creating a, a, at least a more equal um, healthcare system, society, that sort of thing. So I, I just wanted to make that slightly subtle point. Thank you, Lauren. You get the last word. Oh gosh, that's a big responsibility. Um, but especially on such a, a such a question. Uh, but, you know, I think I, I want to harken back to, um, you know, the first session that we had today and some of the comments there uh, that I think really pointed to, uh, you, you know, the threat of being kind of in an echo chamber of people who already know and believe <laughs> firmly um, that structural racism is the source and the cause of, of a lot of the ills that we kind of see um, in health and well-being and within our healthcare system uh, here in the United States. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, again, I, I would kind of double down on this, you know, but we need to develop more empirical research and studies that can really show how structural racism ties directly and is linked um, to specific health outcomes and specific health disparities. And that work, you know, that, that work has been happening. A lot of the pioneers who've been doing that work are, you know, are here today. Um, it's continuing um, and, and it needs to continue. You know, we cannot let, I think, our foot off of the gas of doing that work um, and developing new methodological tools and statistical methods and things in data science, whether it's machine learning or what, using the most advanced state of the art technologies that we have today um, to continue to demonstrate the impact that structural racism has on um, you know, communities uh, that are underrepresented and underserved. With that, I'd like to bring the panel discussion to a close um, by thanking um, all of the panelists for um, their insightful comments. Um, and all of you for joining in the discussion. And I'd like to turn it back over to Sandra um, to continue the, the meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Shanita, and to all the panelists um, for, for a really a great discussion. Um, all right. Well, we are near the end um, of our day one. And um, let me say it's been a tremendous day. Um, I've been tasked to identify some highlights from what we heard. And then if there's time, I'd like to open it up for comments and questions from our audience. Um, given the richness and breadth of today's discussion, uh, providing a summary is challenging. But, but I, what I will say um, is that as an anthropologist, it's clear to me that this workshop confirms what social scientists have long taught us, that science and scientific work is an inherently a social process. It's a set of activities engaged by a set of actors to accomplish a set of goals that involve choices and trade-offs that reflect our values and commitments. And this workshop is part of that process. In our case, it's the aspiration to use genomic research to relieve human suffering equitably. So a major impetus for convening all of us to discuss a research agenda is a sense of urgency to intervene on what many of our speakers um, refer to as the problem of the genomic diversity gap, that stubborn gap in genomic data that disproportionately represents those of European ancestry. So addressing the gap in genomic data must begin with situating the current data landscape in the context of scientific practices and how human groups have been brought into genetic research. This requires critically examining who has been sampled, by whom, and for what purpose, and to recognize data gaps as a product of socio-political relationships over time. These data gaps cannot be disentangled from structural inequities that directly contribute to health disparities that unfairly burden the most marginalized, disenfranchised, unrecognized in our society. We heard this over and over again from our speakers. There's been robust debate today over the use of categories, race, ethnicity, and genetic ancestry in genomic research and how these terms have been used um, in varying ways to index a broad spectrum of variables, lived experience, 
racism in our society, and human biology. And the speakers throughout the day have, um, from what I heard, bemoaned how these categories are used. And yet, as noted by several of our speakers, these are increasingly sedimented into our healthcare system and into our research data in uncritical ways. We have heard that we need research to empirically demonstrate um, how the use or non-use of specific categories impact human health. Uh, so that's one recommendation that I heard quite clearly. Uh, but we also, uh, it seems, uh, need uh, future research on health equity and genomics that relies not only focusing on categories and missing data, but really goes beyond um, issues around recruitment, but on how do we nurture long-term relationships with communities that will engender trustworthiness of the research. Um, as such, equity and genomics will require building infrastructure for community engagement. Critically important, um, we've heard this throughout the day, we'll be diversifying the field of genomics. It requires eliminating barriers to not only entry into the field of genomics, but supporting researchers to flourish and lead. We know empirically that investigators from underrepresented groups produce novel research, generate more innovative solutions to problems, and publish more influential scientific papers. A diverse scientific workforce that promotes the work of Black, Indigenous people, and other people of color, women, sexual and gender minorities, individuals with disabilities, and those from socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, among others, precisely the study populations now targeted for genomic and precision medicine research to fill the diversity gap, uh, we need to, to um, encourage their entry into the field in order to achieve equity. So this challenge goes beyond goals of representation, but gets to the heart of how a science can be co-produced by asking the questions that matter to the communities it seeks to include. This also includes diversifying the entire genomic research ecosystem and critical junctures that narrow the field. And we heard this about um, questioning uh, who is on study sections, who are on the journal editorial boards and review bodies, who are in our training and funding programs. All of this must reflect our commitment to equity. We heard from several speakers that the clinical utility of genomic medicine for underserved communities must be studied. This relates to the limitations of comparing populations, how robust and accurate are standards and references, and can these be improved? We need more research of the psychosocial and behavioral outcomes of providing genomic information to underserved populations. And this requires taking into account not only the research ecosystem, but the clinical handoff. Addressing equity in genomic medicine thus means investigating what benefit actually means for communities that have limited access to care and are under-resourced and addressing these barriers. For example, how do we ensure that benefits of genomic information and interventions are not only realized by communities that have the healthcare infrastructure? Creating a research agenda that can achieve equity in genomic medicine will require creating mechanisms that encourage multidisciplinary research. Um, we heard this uh, actually from the beginning, and I'm thinking here about Nancy Cox's talk, um, in which she described her partnership with social scientists and research of electronic health records and race adjusted for genetic ancestry to do, identify the role of the environment, the lived experience of racialization to understand disparities in hypertension. How do we leverage expertise to augment explanatory power of the environment along with genetics to intervene on disease? How should teams be formed to fully in integrate needed expertise? These seem to be first crucial steps to address racism, ableism, sexism, and other is isms that undermines the quality of our science uh, and its intended goal of relieving human suffering. This will mean creating research that situates genomics within the larger ecosystem and, and our ability to leverage relevant expertise needed to equitably provide benefit. This will mean not only creating partnerships, but empowering community-led research and investing in research and expertise that assesses whether equitable outcomes have actually been achieved. And finally, I just wanted to go back to Latrice Landry's uh, suggestion that we get comfortable with uncomfortable words. She and many others today asked, how do we begin to address power 
and structural racism and other systemic inequities as core commitments in genomics? Should this be a core competency? Not only the ability to explain what that is, but to recognize and integrate it into research questions and design. So I, I think we're off to a good start. Um, and before we end, I just wanted to go to any comments or questions that folks in our, our audience have. Um, and let's see here. If not, I think we can end a few minutes early. It's been a long day. I do have a couple of announcements. Um, well, first and foremost, I would like to thank our speakers and moderators for giving so generously of their expertise, experience, and time to this workshop and to the NHGRI leadership and staff for their vision uh, and implementation of this important discussion. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first day. Um, it set us, up, set us up nicely for day two, which is tomorrow. And tomorrow there will be more substantive time for all of you to engage um, with many of the issues that have surfaced today in small discussion groups. Please note that we will begin at 11 a.m., uh, which is one hour later than we started today, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, and with that, I wanted to thank all of you um, for participating today in this workshop, and I look forward to engaging with each other uh, tomorrow.